tutt'altro qua con David Chalmers, una leggenda della, della filosofia, una leggenda della filosofia della mente, la persona che, che ha dato inizio al campo della filosofia della mente, degli studi sulla ricerca della coscienza che fin dal 94, la persona a cui si deve l'espressione hard problem della coscienza e qualcuno che veramente ha fatto la differenza, quindi sono molto contento di trovarmi qua con lui. E adesso in particolare David Chalmers è qua con noi, è qua con me per ben due fatti recenti. Allora uno che abbiamo fatto il convegno Toward the, uh, the Science of Consciousness TSC 2023 e eh, qua ci siamo trovati insieme con lui a discutere di coscienza, di intelligenza artificiale e di, eh, dei modelli LLM, i modelli de, del linguaggio a larga scala. E allo stesso tempo, oltre quindi a questo convegno a cui abbiamo partecipato tutti e due, David ha anche eh, appena tradotto e pubblicato in italiano il suo ultimo libro, che ho qua con me, un libro molto interessante, si chiama Più Realtà, che nella versione inglese si chiamava Reality Plus. E, ok, David, thank you so much for being here, it's really an incredible opportunity to be together and to discuss uh, this topic, I mean, Uh, we, we met, I think, many years ago mm -hmm. now, so we've been uh, working on consciousness for many, many years. At least years. 20 years, At least 20, maybe more. <laughs> maybe yeah. more, maybe more, exactly. Uh, David, before uh, saying something about your life for the Italian uh, why is consciousness still such a, a difficult problem to... to in general, why is uh -huh. consciousness okay. still so uh -huh. difficult? And yeah, the phenomenon of consciousness It's different from everything else we encounter in science. Normally we encounter things, we can observe them from the outside, we can measure them, we can find mechanisms, we find the mechanism of genetics, and we can begin to explain genetics. We find the mechanism of evolution, we can begin to explain biology, but for consciousness, You can find some mechanisms, you can find what they do in the brain, you can even find some, find how these explain our behavior. But for consciousness, all that is just the easy problem, how it is we do things. There's always, for consciousness, there is this unique further question, why is all this accompanied by experience? This is not a question about functions, about mechanisms, it's a question about experience, about feeling. Right. About, the, uh, about the subject, and it just seems a different kind of question for which our standard kinds of explanation in science don't apply. Right. So, consciousness is still a hard problem. Absolutely, yeah. Mean, it's still as hard. Hard, as hard as it was 20 years ago. I think it's true. The science of consciousness has advanced in many ways. Neuroscience is now much more sophisticated, but it's still primarily a science of correlations. Right. This process in the brain correlates with, is associated with conscious experience. We still don't have the explanation, the question of why and how do these processes in the brain give you consciousness. That is the hard problem and uh, yeah, I think it's just as hard as it was. Yeah, that's something I think on which we both agree. Mm -hmm. Another point uh, that uh, before uh, um, starting to talk a little bit about your book, uh, I would like to address. I mean, in this conference you uh, spoke about LMM, mm -hmm. about the possibility of uh, uh, um, making um, LLM, I mean, lar um, large language models, conscious. Mm -hmm. Is it a possibility or not? I think it's possible in principle. There are some philosophers who say no computer system, no AI system could ever be conscious. I don't agree with this. I don't think there's anything special about human biology. Neurons can give you consciousness somehow. We don't know how, but somehow they do it. I don't see why silicon chips should be any worse than neurons for this. So I think in principle, an AI system could be conscious. If you had a perfect simulation of my brain, I think it would probably be conscious, like me. But now we actually have, for the first time, this is no longer just speculation. For the first time we have AI systems, which are beginning, just beginning to approach the levels of human intelligence. 
at least in many domains. They can talk, they can calculate, they can play games, they can reason, they can write, write code. So now the question arises, are these systems possibly conscious? Because there's a difference between, they're seemingly intelligent, but there's a difference between intelligence and consciousness. Intelligence is about your behavior. Consciousness is about your experience. So the way I approach this is to look for reasons why they might not be conscious. Because they are, these language models are very different from us. They're not simulations of the brain exactly, they're, but they're tr trained on our text. And they behave in a way that's quite human-like, but they're very different on the inside. So the question is, could there be something they're missing which is crucial to consciousness? And for now, I think maybe many language models are missing something. For example, they don't have senses. They just have text. For now, they're just feed-forward processes, no feedback. But already there are models which are multimodal, which have something more like sensors. People are building language models which have feedback. So I think even if now the current language models are not conscious, within 10 years, I think it's quite possible we'll have models which have overcome most of these obstacles and which may be conscious, may right. be conscious, probabilistic. You can't be certain of anything in this area. Is that a, a scary uh, possibility for you? That there will be, that there might be in the future, uh, conscious uh, artificial uh, agents. It's a fascinating possibility. It will change many things, and yeah, it could be scary. First thing we have to worry about is if AI systems are conscious, <laughs> then we have to care about them a bit. Uh, then the question will arise: Are they suffering? Right. Are they happy? And I think once a being is conscious. You have to take these things into account. When they're not conscious, they're merely, t they're merely tools. Right. We don't have to worry. But if they're conscious, we have to worry. We also have to worry that if they're conscious, they might also become self-conscious. They might start to reason about their own place in the world with their own interests. And this, of course, can lead to many, many possible dangers. So we are living in very interesting times. Very interesting times. Very interesting times. Time. Unexpected all this would happen so soon. Exactly. Ten years ago, this was not on the scene. Probably everyone thought this was decades away, but exactly. suddenly it's coming fast. I totally agree. Nobody was expecting to have that kind of model working so well in mm -hmm. such a short time. It's yep. been all taken by surprise. Yeah, the computer power, yes. the data, and machine learning is more powerful than we thought it was. Yeah. Okay, let's go to your book now. Mm -hmm. I mean, the book that is called uh, Reality Plus, in the original version, and it is called uh, it is uh, about virtual worlds. And more and reality in the more reality. More reality. Sorry, like in more reality. No, no. In the, the original version is Reality Plus. Exactly. I remember that I like title. The plus. Yeah. Exactly. But that was a cool title. Yeah. I like that very yeah. much. For Italian, they like more reality. More reality. Yeah. Okay. Can you just summarize it for the Italian readers? Yeah. It's really thinking about many problems in philosophy through the lens of technology, especially the technology of virtual reality and artificial worlds. I'm thinking about these technologies and what they mean and using this to introduce many of the big problems in philosophy and maybe to make some progress on them. So my central thesis is virtual reality is genuine reality. Many people think virtual reality, so here we're talking about virtual reality, the kind you might get from a, a virtual reality headset, like the MetaQuest, Apple is releasing a headset soon, maybe two weeks, they're announcing it. Um, and the question is, what is the nature of the reality you experience when you experience virtual reality? Some say it's a hallucination, some say it's an illusion. I want to say it's real. Inside virtual reality, you're in contact with real objects in a real world. They're digital objects, they're implemented on a computer, but they're no less real for this. Digital reality is reality too. And this is a general theme okay. of the book. Let, let, let me ask you a, a philosophical question about that. Is, uh, not, is uh, virtual reality not made of physical stuff in front of our eyes when we look at it? rather than being um, 
a true virtual world? Is, is it not made of the stuff that we perceive when we are inside a, a virtual reality headset or something like that? Yeah, I think so. Right. It's made of digital processes which are running on a computer. And really what you are perceiving is those digital processes running on the circuitry inside your computer. But those are real digital entities. Um, you know, I mean, some people say you're just perceiving the screen of the headset. Like, no, 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 no. That's like saying you perceive your glasses. Maybe, but what's important is what you perceive through the glasses. Okay. When I watch uh, Donald Trump on TV, it's really Donald Trump I'm seeing, okay. not the TV. Okay, that's an interesting point. Uh, so, and I like the approach, something that you just mentioned, the fact that uh, using uh, technology we can have a new approach to traditional uh, philosophical problems. Mm -hmm. Walter Benjamin, the philosopher, used to say that the base changes uh, faster than the superstructure. Mm -hmm. It's a bit Hegelian approach, uh -huh. but it is uh, somehow uh, along the same line of the book. So mm -hmm. you're suggesting that the base, the technological uh, basis of our existence is changing the way in which we understand ourselves mm -hmm. and the way in which we can approach uh, the traditional problem from mm -hmm. a philosophical perspective. Technology around allows us to repose many of the great philosophical problems. What is the nature of the mind? Originally we had just one case, the human mind, maybe some animal minds. Once we have artificial minds, which are very different, we can raise all the philosophical questions again. Are these genuine minds? Are human minds no. like these artificial minds? And exactly the same is true for virtual reality. In philosophy, we ask questions, what is the nature of reality? How can we know about no. reality? But having this technology, ask, ask, we can now ask questions about how can ar ar artificial reality. Right. How can we know we are not living in a simulation? I think for, if it's a perfect simulation, one which is indistinguishable from physical reality, then you can never rule this out. In principle, if it's perfect, it will be indistinguishable. Now, if it's if it's an imperfect simulation, there might be some glitches, like the cat that crosses your path twice in the uh, in the matrix. Maybe there'll be some physical experiments you do that can reveal this. But if it's a perfect simulation, you'll never know. So, and I think it's possible. I don't rule out that we're living in a very sophisticated, perfect simulation in years to come. We may have the ability to put people in perfect simulations. Right. If it's done well enough, they will never know. But based on Leibniz's principle of the identity of the indiscernible, that states that if two things are really indistinguishable, then they're the same thing. Would a, a simulation, an indistinguishable simulation, not be mm. just a reality? I say indistinguishable is an epistemological notion. Leibniz is indiscernible as a metaphysical notion. If they have the same properties, he says they're the same thing. I don't say that virtual reality has the same properties. It's different in some ways from physical reality. It's built out of computer processes, for example. Physical properties are not. So they're different. They have different properties. But they're epistemologically indistinguishable in that they appear exactly the same. So it's impossible for us to distinguish them. I mean, maybe it's like two completely identical twins. I can't distinguish them, but they're still different people. Right. One final question, then, I mean, the time is running out. So this is the final question, then if you want to add anything, please feel free to do. A chapter, that, uh, a section of the book that I found particularly interesting is the one about violence mm -hmm. and ethics, something mm -hmm. that you haven't touched so far Never, yeah. in your work. And so it is an extremely interesting take about this problem, because after all, philosophy cannot be satisfied just uh, let's say, uh, replying to uh, ontological problems. We need to also have some kind of uh, ethical, uh, not guidance, but some kind of uh, ethical perspective from philosophy. So can you summarize that aspect? Of what were your conclusions about uh, values and the like? Yeah, you know, ethics has never been a specialty of mine. I think especially about the mind and reality. But when you think about these issues, ethics has never far away. Actually, the same is true for consciousness, because when you raise questions, could a machine be conscious? One of the reasons that's such an important question is we care how we treat the machines. If it's conscious, 
It has some moral status and we have to treat it well. So I got led to thinking about what is the connection between consciousness and morality. And many of the same questions come up again for virtual worlds, for people who are, think virtual reality is not genuine reality. They might think a life in a virtual world is meaningless or without value. Or at best, it's got the kind of value that an entertainment has. Robert Nozick, in his thought experiment of the experience machine, seemed to suggest that a virtual reality is not real and it lacks life in there, lacks value. I argue, by contrast, that you can, in principle, lead a perfectly meaningful life, a valuable life, <coughs> in a virtual world. We are conscious beings and we bring our consciousness with us to a virtual world. What happens inside a virtual world can really matter. Already in virtual worlds like Second Life, people build communities, they build relationships. I saw a movie recently, we got married in virtual reality, right. about a couple that's, which, who met there, married outside. So I think all this is, uh, is meaningful. The meaning, it comes from us, and digital reality can support meaning just as well so as physical easy, reality. So easy and good are in virtual reality too. So they're not virtual. So that, that is kind of a Cartesian uh, taste. He also said that even in a purely mental world, mm -hmm. there has to be something that is real. Uh -huh. and so you're suggesting that uh, evil and good, if uh, they would take place because of conscious agent mm -hmm. in uh, a virtual world, they would be the only not virtual thing. Yeah, I think value comes from consciousness and from its interaction with reality. And I think this, it can do this just as well with digital reality as with physical reality. And yeah, I think it's the full range. This is not to say that virtual reality will be purely wonderful or all good. It's to say the full spectrum of human experience and human value will be available from the wonderful to the awful. Right. So this is not to say it will be paradise, but it means that it will be meaningful and it will be a life that really matters. Okay, that's a very nice note to end our conversation that I really enjoy. So that's uh, the book once again, and uh, let's hope to have uh, even more decades to continue to uh -huh. discuss and to see what it happens in the future. For so, sure, and in your, in your next conference, I want to hear, I am the digital apple. And you are the digital apple. That's the thing. I am the digital apple. <laughs> I'm that, seeing a digital apple and I am the digital apple. That might be the next title uh -huh. of my next talk. Yeah. Thank you very much, David. Very Thank good. you so much.